ready. Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Gabriel Kahn. I'm a professor at USC Annenberg School of Journalism. Uh, today with me, we have uh, a couple of excellent panelists to talk about the issue of subscriptions versus memberships and understanding new revenue models for news, which I think is the most important question that we can ask ourselves right now, because uh, if we really want to think about what the most critical existential threat to journalism is, it is uh, sustainability. And uh, just to kind of set this up before I introduce our panelists, um, first of all, uh, just a word that this notion of subscriptions and memberships, I think we're going to talk about it in what is very much an American context, and I understand that we have an international audience. Um, uh, and so I hope some of this translates in the way that sort of these revenue models are now sort of uh, playing out in the U.S. But um, first of all, when we sort of set this up as subscriptions versus memberships, um, it is a little bit sort of Superman versus Batman. It's not that either one of these is sort of evil and that one will triumph over the other. Uh, both are, you know, interesting and important, but they do have significant differences, and that's what we sort of want to talk about. Um, more broadly, the, uh, I think everybody might be familiar with this slide if we talk about sort of why we're having this conversation now, because the traditional business model of journalism no longer functions. That is an ad-driven business model. Uh, and this slide, which, you know, has been making the rounds now for several years, sort of shows a decline of how... Oh, I'm sorry. Matteo. Uh, Matteo. Um, the slides here are not corresponding to the one on the computer, so um, uh, that's why my Superman versus Batman joke didn't, didn't, didn't get a laugh at all. I'm so sorry. Yes. Um, uh, however, this is not essential. We can we can continue on with this. Um, <laughs> the uh, advertising revenue at publications uh, has uh, has collapsed. Uh, we've seen that those advertising dollars migrate. No? Bear with us here. Okay, so while we, while we sort this out, I'll continue with my rant here. Uh, really what we've seen is uh, as the uh, advertising revenues no longer uh, support publications, we've seen a move toward reader revenue. And reader revenue can come in various forms. It can come in subscriptions. It can come in memberships um, in various different ways. Um, it's important to understand those different ways uh, and what they mean for a publication because your business model is your destiny. Each one of those has um, uh, changes the editorial mission. Uh, just as we've seen when uh, many news organizations were trying to survive on a, uh, a click-based uh, model or uh, distributing content through Facebook and trying to derive revenue off of that, that changes the type of content that you produce. Uh, so let me just quickly run through this. There was my joke about Superman and, and, uh, and Batman. Uh, here's the collapse of newspaper revenue, very quickly. Uh, and here is a sort of steady uh, rise in reader revenue, basically circulation revenue. Um, which you know certainly doesn't replace the advertising dollars that have disappeared, uh, but does show some hope. Um, we've also we have to remember how kind of new this whole model is. It was only in 2011 that the New York Times put up a paywall, um, but now that reader revenue it plays so much of a more important pillar in a news organization's business model, we see that the messaging from news organizations has begun to change. I'm sure uh, you can see here that reader revenue, circulation revenue for the New York Times has grown about 20% over the last six, seven years. Advertising revenue has dropped almost 50%. Um, but now we see the publications sort of talk about themselves differently. I'm sure that you're all familiar with this new uh, slogan that the Washington Post has adopted, democracy dies in darkness. This is a different kind of way of communicating with their readers that has implications for the business model itself. Um, I think that we're going to also just kind of draw a line here about the distinction between subscription and membership and what that means. Um, 
and I think I'm using, uh, so I'll use this quote as a way of, of kind of describing it, but subscription is a pricing structure, membership is a mindset. Uh, and there are a lot of different choices that a publication, that a news organization has to make as it moves from one to the other. Um, so with that, let me, let me pass it on to our, our guests, uh, Mary Walker Brown, who uh, has pioneered a lot of the new thinking and execution of membership models. Um, but Mary and, and is the founder of the News Revenue Hub. Um, but this didn't happen overnight. This came by way of, of experience uh, and your previous incarnation as the publisher of Voice of San Diego. Can you talk a little bit about how you kind of, I don't want to say stumbled onto memberships, but really began to see the opportunity that a membership model presents? And yeah. maybe also if you want to talk about what, if you want to define briefly what a membership model is as opposed to a subscription model. Sure. Um, I think it's always really important to understand the difference between membership and subscription. And what we found at Voice of San Diego when we asked our audience, um, they frankly didn't know. Um, so the difference, just to be perfectly clear, is subscribers subscribe to your email product and members give you money. So there's a financial transaction that is involved with being a member. And we found that our subscribers were getting our email every day and felt this very close bond to us because they started their day with us. but. Um, they hadn't give us, given us any money, and that's simply because we didn't ask and we didn't establish to them that a member is someone who supports us financially. So just to give you some background on Voice of San Diego, it was founded in 2005, and in the States, it's really kind of considered the first strictly digital nonprofit local news organization in the country. And they were really pioneering the whole concept of what that meant as a new business model. Um, and so membership was really a part of their DNA from the very beginning in that they were always very open with the community that they needed their support um, financially in order for this operation to grow and thrive. Um, so for the first six years or so, it was a very sort of sporadic kind of strategy. Um, there would be the typical sort of year-end campaign where we'd ask for money, but it was mostly framed in a way that, hey, if you like us, give us some money and support what we do. But there wasn't this really strong imperative that no, reader revenue is a real part of our business model and we needed you to understand why. So when I came on board in 2011, I spent uh, the first three or four months or so doing a really deep dive analysis into Voice of San Diego, but all of the other peers who had kind of sprung up um, since their inception. So we looked at Min Post, um, ProPublica, Texas Tribune, um, the Bay Citizen at the time. And, and what I really found across the board was that news organizations are really good at telling other people's story, but we're not good at all of crafting or telling our own story. So we're just not comfortable talking about ourselves as journalists. And as a result, our readers have no real idea um, about our business model or what we need to stay afloat. So at Voice of San Diego, we realized that we had to be much more um, consistent and intentional with our messaging and our communications with our readers and we had to help them understand the shift that Gabe just described in those slides, that we had to make them sort of confront this idea that advertising and, and classifieds were no longer the main source of revenue for news organizations, and that readers were going to need to step up in a more meaningful way if they wanted that particular news organization to, to continue to exist. And so we knew we needed to do that. It was happening in fits and starts because we had a super small staff, and so we'd send emails out, and then we would realize you know, three or four months would go by and we hadn't sent another email. And so, you know, that's not the way that you cultivate a relationship with anyone um, with that kind of sporadic approach. So we really started um, investigating what could we do on the back end technology side to really streamline um, our communications. And so um, we really, we found three different products, Salesforce to manage our database, MailChimp for, for email communications, and Stripe as a donation processor to really be able to streamline and automate a lot of the messaging that really goes into developing a membership program. And what I mean by that is anytime somebody enters our funnel, if they subscribe to a newsletter, if they registered a comment on the site, if they sign up through Eventbrite to come to one of our events, that information is immediately and automatically sent to Salesforce where it's either reconciled with an existing member or it's put in a bucket for the beginning of, a, of an email conversation that happens over the course of several weeks and months. And so what we found is once we were able to streamline and automate that, there was just a complete transformation in how many um, of our subscribers we were converting to email because we helped them understand 
who we were, and we automated those conversations so that we knew they were happening. But those conversations were very personal. Um, the first email is from the publisher, the next email would be from the editor, the next one would be from a reporter. So it wasn't these um, really you know, automated kind of generic emails, it was very personal, helping them understand the concept. And so when we started to do that, we really started to see that membership could become a more significant revenue stream for us. Um, the goal at Voice of San Diego was to have um, it represent 25% of its revenue, and now I believe it's about 23%. <coughs> And so once we started seeing that success, we started trying to help others in the industry replicate that success. And what we found is they simply didn't have the internal resources or the staffing or the expertise to manage Salesforce and, and, and the tech side, much less the ongoing sort of digital communication strategy. So that was really the inception for the hub. We decided um, if we can't help others do it themselves, maybe we should create a system and a service that does it for them. And so you're, we're talking about a new business model, but what you're really sort of describing is kind of building new culture. Exactly. And uh, so tell us a little bit about the hub and how it operates and how many clients you have and so forth. Right, so we have um, 16 clients now. We launched in November of 2016 with um, a pilot group and Ben and Civil Beat were a part of that pilot. And obviously that was a very serendipitous time to be starting a membership program right after the 2016 election. Um, and so there was a lot of soul searching going on and hand wringing and people were like, what do we do? And we, we all said- That hasn't stopped by the way. You support journalism that you believe in, that's what you do. And so obviously there was kind of a landslide of, of donations that were coming in. So we realized we were onto something and a line kind of formed um, uh, for other news organizations who wanted to join. And so the, the slide that you see right now are, are the current organizations that are, that are in the news revenue hub. And what the service really entails is we go in and we spend two days in each newsroom helping them sort of develop a story uh, around their brand, which is what, what is the offering, what is your value proposition, and in kind of traditional marketing, but really what is the relationship that you want to start building with your members and how can you really fulfill that relationship and deliver that. And so what we're also really mindful of is coming from a small news organization, you know, I don't want to go in there with some pie in the sky ideas of what their membership benefits should be. They have to be able to deliver them. So the first step is just coming up with some simple tiers, excuse me, and simple benefits that they can actually deliver. Um, and then it's also working with the editorial team and getting them bought in. So those two days, does, it does not consist of me talking to their development team. That would not fulfill the mission of what we're trying to accomplish. Editorial has to be at the table. Um, the engagement team has to be at the table. Tech has to be there. It has to be a whole shift in the newsroom culture that they're able to deliver on these promises that they're making to their readers. And so it does take some time to convince them. Um, but what I've found is the greatest way to convince the editorial team to get on board is to have them write an email and for them to see the money that comes in as a result of it. And then all of a sudden there's, there's a business proposition to this. And it also really makes them feel good to see that they're reporting um, and the editorial decisions that they're making and the mission that they work so hard to fulfill on a daily basis really means something to their audience and that they're willing to invest in it. So it's definitely a culture shift, um, but I think it's one that needs to happen regardless. We need to have a closer relationship with our audience, and if you can tie it to revenue, um, that's the quickest way to hardwire that culture change. Okay, so Ben, first of all, Ben Nishimoto uh, has the distinction of possibly traveling the furthest to get here. Um, <laughs> This is where he comes from, so don't feel too badly for him. <laughs> Honolulu is his beat. Um, but Ben, first of all, you started in working in, uh, with a public broadcaster mm -hmm. in Honolulu, and then you joined Civil Beat. Um, so you were familiar with kind of asking the audience to pony up mm -hmm. um, uh, with your work with a public broadcaster. But when you came to Civil Beat, can you first of all describe a little bit about what Civil, Civil Beat had uh, launched itself, what its sort of proposition was when it launched, its original business model of trying to earn revenue through a paywall and how that was changing. Sure, so Honolulu Civil Beat, uh, we, we were launched in 2010 by Piero Midiar. And um, we're unique in that we have experienced life as a for-profit paywall subscription model. And then about a year and a half ago, we made the transition uh, with the help of the News Revenue Hub to uh, uh, um, member-supported uh, nonprofit um, with no paywall. Um, so, you know, when we did launch, we were, because of our founder, um, we were in a pretty enviable position where our mission-based editorial strategy 
um, was not driven uh, immediately by a retail strategy. Um, Pierre wanted to start a local news site that focused strictly on the journalism um, and to focus on filling uh, investigative watchdog enterprise media gaps in, in the local market in Hawaii. So that was, our, uh, that was our purpose, first and foremost. So we always had this mission-based strategy. Um, our business uh, strategy was almost uh, sort of an afterthought in that you know, uh, six or seven years ago, uh, there wasn't this sort of burgeoning uh, membership model um, at the time. So uh, they launched a subscription paywall. Uh, they, they surmised that if we can get you know, 5,000 folks to, to pay $20 a month, um, for access to our content that will be sustainable within the year. Um, this story may sound familiar, but our, our, our paywall, which was at $19.99 a month, eventually went from that there to $10 a month, um, from $10 to $4.99. Uh, and then our, uh, over time, our paywall became quite porous. Um, what we found was... And, and this is just because you weren't getting the kind of traction with that pricing. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, so people weren't experiencing our content. They weren't willing to pay for it. And it wasn't necessarily because our content was poor. Um, we felt on the editorial side that we were fulfilling our mission, that we were producing good journalism. But we weren't messaging our, our content to, to readers in a way that would compel them to become subscribers. Um, I think the problem with uh, an upstart, small digital outlet that starts as a subscription-based <coughs> model, there's really no proof of performance. So um, much of your me messaging is taken up uh, telling people to subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. The calls to action is always transactional. Um, you're not working on cultivating these more organic uh, relationships with your reader uh, because the messaging and the business model doesn't lend itself to that type of, of messaging. Um, so that was our, our fundamental problem. Um, so a year and a half ago, the, the editorial team there decided we're going to make the switch. Uh, uh, we believe fundamentally that uh, information is a public service um, and access to that should be free. Uh, so we decided let's go ahead and do that. Um, let's empower our readers to support our work. And we made the announcement to lift our paywall. Um, and, and since then, uh, because of having a membership-based model on the back end, uh, it makes it much more easy, and uh, we're able to message um, our purpose as a nonprofit news site uh, in a clearer way. Um, we start with uh, letting folks know exactly what our mission is, the, uh, what we seek to, to uh, serve to the people in Hawaii, um, and through a process of educating readers on uh, the work that we do and why we exist, um, we're letting people know, hey, your, our content is free, uh, but if you value what we do, if you feel like we're providing a public service, um, then we encourage you to become a member supporter. Um, and of course, we have sort of tiers of benefits. I come from PBS. Uh, public media is known for having the seven CD box sets, the tote bags, um, all of those things. Uh, we were deliberate in creating our membership strategy that uh, is tiered based on um, uh, more intangible mission-based products to make people understand that, hey, you're making a donation uh, the money that you give to us is going to support our newsroom and our journalists. Um, so, you know, when we made that transition, it was a huge leap of faith. Uh, we, in lifting our paywall, we, we, uh, we, we also lifted our, our revenue strategy, and um, we put the onus on readers to support our work. Um, uh, 12 months in, we're happy to report that we've actually generated more revenue uh, uh, from nonprofit tax deductible donations than we had than we ever had as a for-profit subscription-based model. Um, our prior subscription amount at $4.99 a month. Uh, uh, contrast that with our current uh, monthly donation average amount of $11 a month. Um, we're also able to, to access foundation support for a lot of our work as well. So um, overall, sort of the, the baseline metrics are showing that people are willing to, people are valuing our journalism at a, a, a higher amounts than perhaps we had we had uh, ever thought and it's a model that we're going to continue to pursue in the in the future for sure so so Ben can you describe the difference from working at a PBS station and the kind of pledge drive uh, approach that PB that public media has toward its audience with 
the membership model that you're talking about now. And for those in the audience who don't, who aren't familiar with American public media, several times a year, whether it's a public television station or public radio, they get on the air and they beg you and they beg you and they try to make you feel guilty and they won't shut up. They take their content away. And they take their content <laughs> away and they replace it with people saying, please, please, and they sound desperate. Uh, and eventually, to get them to shut up, you give them your credit card and then they go away and then they come back six months later. Right. Um, is that a fair assessment of how it's w done? <laughs> I was planning not to disparage PBS in that way, <laughs> but, uh, but it, it's, that's sort of what it has become. Um, so you know, when, when public broadcasting in America started, it really pioneered the, the membership model where in order to get public support, they developed these tiers um, and attached to these tiers certain member benefits, mostly uh, uh, tangible items like DVDs, CDs, um, and tote bags. And tote bags. Um, but so because that model was so popular and effective, in doing so, they, um, over the years, they became a lot more transactional, where, um, you know, if you, if you, in one year, for a $60 donation, offer a tote bag, in order to renew that same donor in the following year, you're required to produce a better tote bag or a larger tote bag or something with a nicer logo. Um, and year after year, you're sort of in this rat race of trying to produce these items um, that aren't necessarily tied to your mission and, and, and your core work. So I think over the years, uh, public broadcasting has sort of gone astray and focused on uh, how to bring in revenue regardless of the, the type of mission they're trying to promote. And um, you know, we want to apply some of those concepts to, to nonprofit journalism, but I think we have to be careful as to uh, making sure that we uh, because this, this business model and concept is new to this particular industry, that we make sure that readers understand that you're sure you are getting certain benefits, but in the end you're donating to support the reporters and the journalism that you've come to trust. Um, so that's sort of the, the line that we're, we're trying to um, straddle at this point. So Mary, as we've seen, you know, that Google and Facebook take 80% of, however you count it, uh, of every dollar of, of digital advertising, which gives them the money to fund conferences like this. Um, uh, lots, of, lots of publications, lots of news organizations are now, of course, exploring membership as an option. But this is not a, a one-size-fits-all kind of strategy. What, mm -hmm. is, what are the attributes of a news organization that can pull this off and who can't do it? Yeah. Well, I think it, you have to have that commitment to, to shift the culture and to really embrace um, building a relationship with your audience and then maintaining that relationship. Um, just to speak a little bit about the benefits, whenever we go in and we start working with a new client, they get really hung up on creating the benefits and there is this inclination to really overthink, um, which we really um, try to you know, steer them another direction. Like benefits are not about recruiting, they're really about retaining. So you want, um, people are gonna come in because you've asked them to support you and because they value your content and they're gonna choose an amount that they think is consistent with the value that you provide. Then the benefits that you give them are really about deepening the relationship so that when it's time to renew, um, they're already completely bought in and invested and so that's why what Ben is talking about, their, their benefits and most of our clients' benefits are all driven around access and experience. So it's member coffees or happy hours or um, exclusive member reports that provide sort of a behind the scenes look at what it takes to run a news organization and what it means to file for um, a public records request. You know, it's really sort of lifting the veil and people love that. Obviously, they love the post and spotlight. So if we can take what we're doing and commit to sort of showing some vulnerabilities, um, you can really develop a really intense relationship with your readers, but that's the kind of commitment it takes to be successful at this. And so the organizations who are really willing to buy into that editorially and sort of shift some of their business practices and newsroom structure to allow the reporters and the editors to have time to create some of those kind of newsletter products, those are the ones who are really successful. If they're just phoning it in and putting a membership page up on their site and doing the occasional pitch, um, the audience sees through that, just like anybody that you're trying to have a relationship would see through something like that. So you really have to create those products and I can't, um, overemphasize enough the importance of having amazing newsletter products, both for the recruitment to build the funnel to get people into your database 
and then to have a newsletter product that's exclusive for members that helps deepen the relationship. And that's a big commitment from the editorial side. And so, you know, we really have to stress that there's, a, there's ROI on that. And so I think we are, we're really spending the second year of the News Revenue Hub really helping our clients work with product uh -oh. development and creating really successful newsletter best practices and compelling products that get people in the funnel, right? So most of our clients don't have a problem with traffic. I mean, we can always grow our audience, but there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in the people who are already coming to these sites consistently, but getting them in the funnel so that we can start to have those very personal and intentional conversations with them about membership is the real key strategy point that we have to focus on. Okay, now, so I'll, sorry, go ahead, ben. I'll just briefly add that, you know, when we made the decision to transition to a nonprofit, the, the one question that the newsroom asked itself was, you know, how do we create a newsroom that's optimized for trust? Because if we're going to lift our paywall, um, you know, people subscribe because they want access to content. Um, people donate because they trust your content and they want to invest in your mission. So we had to ask ourselves, you know, in order for people to trust us, what are some of the things we needed to do on the editorial side to, to engender that trust? And part of that is um, radical transparency and, um, you know, uh, lifting the veil of the newsroom, as Mary said, but creating these in-person and online engagement opportunities for our reporters to get them comfortable interacting with our readers. Um, giving readers access to content that they normally wouldn't have, um, greater context around certain articles, um, why, we, why we publish certain things and why we didn't publish others, um, being committed to, to um, publishing our full list of donors in full transparency. Um, we felt like if we wanted to demand accountability and transparency from legislators and influencers in our communities, we had to walk the walk and be transparent ourselves. Um, so developing all of the, you know, committing to, to opening our newsroom and aligning uh, uh, that strategy and tiering it so that we message it as a series of member benefits is something that we spend a lot of time on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a really important question to ask our newsroom. Um, it, it's a, it's a, a, a huge change in the way reporters see themselves and their work and their mission um, and how they interact on the, uh, with the folks on the business end. Um, to create sort of this open newsroom where everyone can feel comfortable working in. So, so Ben, both you and Mary have really talked about the importance of the mission as coming sort of even before the business model as being essentially a prerequisite here. Mary, if we look at these clients that you have, these are all very mission-driven mm -hmm. organizations. Um, yet, uh, is this something that is really only going to be in the realm of not-for-profit media is, is there, can we just draw a circle around who can pull off a sort of membership type approach or can this be expanded to for-profit media in some fashion? Definitely, I think we found, and you know, that was the experiment we wanted to conduct. We brought on um, three or four for-profits. Um, PolitiFact was for-profit when they joined um, in 2016. They were a for-profit arm of the Tampa Bay Times. And so the messaging was gonna be very experimental in that yes, we're a for-profit entity, but we, like everyone else in this industry, has to guard our budget, you know, and we need, if you care about facts and if you care about PolitiFact and the product it produces, help us make sure that we can continue to provide this independent department of the Tampa Bay Times, and the readers loved it. Um, and so what we found in launching three other sites is that it's less about that tax-deductible donation um, and it's more really about supporting a news organization that they value and trust. And some of the questions that we pose to the audience in an in a audience survey that we do before we develop the membership program are questions like, if PolitiFact or Civil Beat cease to exist tomorrow, would you feel you've lost a source of, of information and news that you can't find anywhere else? And so when you get 80% of your readers saying yes, I would lose a source of information I can't find anywhere else, then you know your editorial strategy is right on the mark, right? Because you're distinct. But when you get 40% of them, you know, saying uh, yes, then, then you have to reevaluate your editorial product. Another question that we ask is, if Civil Beat or PolitiFact were to launch a membership program to help um, produce a revenue stream to keep us, um, uh, help us thrive, would you support us? Um, the first answer is typically, uh, what can we do to get you to join? The first one will say, 
Um, 70 or 80 percent will say, just ask, I value what you do. Um, the next response is typically, help us understand why you need our support. And the third is typically some type of, offer me some type of benefit that I care about. So I think the need is out there. People need to just be confronted with why a for-profit or a non-profit needs their support. So, I mean, I think one thing that's happening broadly in journalism is, um, you know, it used to be, to, to quote Ben Thompson, the Stratectory uh, blog author, mm -hmm. you know, used to do the journalism and you got the business model for free. It was pretty straightforward. Yeah. There is now this tremendous effort to educate the audience uh, about the process of reporting, uh, transparency that goes along with that, um, but also about the role that the audience plays in this, right? Mm -hmm. And of course now when so many people have, uh, via social platforms and others, become so accustomed to not paying at all for news, and of course I always ask my students, you know, how, who are journalism students, how many of them actually pay for the content that they get? It's not very many. Um, uh, but this process of education is, is crucial. When you move to a membership model and you really have to think about uh, this messaging and this mission, what does it do to the, uh, the editorial content, the editorial product? Um, by this I mean that if you are out there um, trying to get a mass audience mm -hmm. and you are going to be writing headlines that are going to be more uh, clickable, more, um, uh, more shareable, that have certain attributes, right? That they have high emotional content or something like that, that <laughs> they have a positive spin on them. Uh, if you have a subscription-based model, then there's some type of exclusivity and scarcity to that type of content. Um, when you were the Voice of San Diego mm -hmm. and you started to move to a membership model, and you started to have this relationship with your audience and cultivate this relationship with your audience, how did that change the kind of editorial product that you were producing? I don't know that it changed overnight. It was more of, a, of an evolution. And I think it started happening um, thanks to having those kind of platforms and engagement opportunities with the readers. Um, an example that I always love to give is, is the member coffee example, where once a month, um, reporters would gather with our audience, usually around 30 or 40 people is an intimate gathering, to talk about issues that they're concerned about in the community. And so we would really ask and, and make it um, an expectation for the reporting staff to be there. And we would talk about issues that they're writing about. So for example, a big story in San Diego a couple of years ago was the Chargers football team was threatening to move to Los Angeles. And when I say football, I mean American football, not, <laughs> not, not real football. And so it was a big issue about the Chargers. And we had been writing about it and writing about it like crazy. We had dedicated months and months and months of rec reporting time and staff time to this issue. And when we went to member coffee and we asked people about the issues that they care about, they were not talking about the Chargers moving to Los Angeles. They were talking about streets and sidewalks and public safety and their schools. And so it's, it was a real reality check for our reporters to be confronted with this issue of it might seem like a sexy story that we cared about, but in reality, our readers really were more concerned with real, true quality of life issues. And so over time, we started to use those member coffees as sort of mini focus groups to help really refine our focus on the editorial product. And so, Ben, you've had this experience, too. Once you move to a membership model, you are really making a promise to your audience, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if there's, uh, on a subscription model, as you said before, it's, it's very clear. We did this journalism. You got to pay for it. Here it is. And if they pay, great. Now, it's a different proposition. And that relationship with your audience changes the, the newsroom itself. Can you talk a little bit about what you guys had to go through and if there were any kind of growing pains in that? Sure. So when, when a reader becomes a donor, um, they, they become far more engaged in your product. Uh, they consider themselves investors, not necessarily in your business, but in your mission. So, you know, when we had uh, for-profit subscribers, we would rarely hear from them. Um, uh, aside from, you know, the, the customary tips that we receive, things like that. Um, when we onboarded donors uh, who would give um, $100,000, $200,000, they considered themselves investors in our mission. So they would email us more frequently, they'd participate uh, in our events, um, and they'd be uh, uh, much more open, open in telling us what they thought. So. Um, 
I think at first when we made that transition, we didn't realize that the, the behavior of our readership would fundamentally change. And in a sense, moving to a donation model actually empowers them to become more involved. Um, initially, we weren't necessarily uh, uh, open to that type of feedback. Um, you know, it, with our newsroom, um, it's easy, you know, to have sort of this one-way conversation where, it was more, where it's more of a broadcast. So all of a sudden, we're hearing from more of our readers and they're much more forceful in, in uh, what they think of our content and what they want to hear. And um, now we're, as a, as a newsroom, the editorial side is forced to actually uh, uh, listen to their concerns and incorporate those. Um, so I think part of uh, moving toward that um, was being deliberate about getting our reporters to become comfortable receiving that type of feedback. Um, and I think the, the member coffees or the morning coffees as, as, as we call them uh, really helped. Um, we invite, we, every month we invite folks into our newsroom. They can be, uh, oftentimes they're donors, a lot of times they're readers. Um, but creating these um, non-threatening casual situations where reporters can hear from readers is something that's really important. And um, the other thing that, that we try to, to uh, message to our reporters is that, um, you know, they have cheerleaders, you know, they have fans. They're, it's not just folks, uh, it, folks no longer just email us because they're critical. Um, they, they email us because they, they like our mission. Um, whenever we do send out a fundraising appeal and we call ourselves independent, um, accountable, and transparent, um, when folks respond to that and make donations, there's a little part in our donation uh, widget that asks, you know, why you decided to give. And oftentimes, if we tell someone who we are, uh, they respond with a donation and letting us know they're giving to us because of the reasons that we told them we stand for. Um, so we try to make sure that our reporters understand that, you know, there are people out there, our readers, who, who not only value our content, but are willing to, to stand up with us. Um, and I think that's a, that's a major shift in terms of uh, reporters getting buy-in. So Ben, that sounds very promising. It also sounds like really terrifying if you're a reporter and you have to deal with your audience and they're telling you something and that they feel that they're <laughs> investors and then they expect you to follow up on that. And yeah. uh, has that well, think, cr created any awkward yeah, moments? Well, so, or you have, you not, have you always been able to fulfill their expectations? No, so, so just because I think just because readers want us to cover something, it doesn't mean that we're going to cover it. Um, but we found if we explain to them why we decided to go a different direction and we're transparent in uh, the reasons why we decided to do so, um, that, that goes a long way. So uh, we recently launched what's called, what we we're calling Understand the News. It's a section of our website. Uh, each week our editor writes about why we decided to publish a certain story what went behind that decision. Um, so not only are people learning these news literacy concepts, but we're explaining to them um, in a manner that we can control um, why we decided to do certain things. And uh, people may not agree with us. That's not something that we, we actively uh, want necessarily. But I think if people understand the thought process behind a lot of our decisions, that goes a long way toward um, trust. So Mary, you've got a whole tech stack that's involved in converting uh, an organization to a membership model, and I want to get to that. But in talking with you, it seems like when you take on a new client, the, you know, the biggest problem is not the technology, it's something else. And I think that anybody who works in a newsroom knows that the three strongest forces in the universe are uh, inertia, culture, and stupidity. And uh, the culture part of it is really tough, right? I mean, would you, can you talk to me about some of the, the sort of cultural snags that you hit in trying to get people to execute on this? Yeah, well, there's, there's two main snags that we hit. One is that they rarely, I mean, a news organization rarely wants to be as aggressive as we want them to be in messaging and, and, and frequency. And so they're not used to asking for money. It feels like they're compromising their integrity. Um, it's a distraction from what they really want to be writing about, and so they just want to do the bare minimum. 
Um, and then they get the minimal results as, as a result of that. And so what we try to explain to them and show them with real data, and now that we've been doing this for a year and a half, we can use real data from other news organizations, is that A, our audience is very tolerant of, of the ask, and they're certainly not reading every single one of them, so you have to be really redundant and consistent and continuous. Um, but that's a big one. I mean, and it's, it's an ongoing challenge. And so for us, it's really helpful now to frame those conversations um, around data instead of around you know, anecdotal evidence of what worked at Voice of San Diego. And so that's what we're really, really focusing on and, and publishing those best practices for the industry at large so you can start to make, instead of emotional decisions, which is what's you know, really, um, that's how these editors are making a lot of their decisions is around an emotion. Um, if we can make it about data and show that you're not getting opt-outs, you're not getting unsubscribes, they don't think that you're a sellout, um, then there's, they can't really argue because it's, we are showing that it works. Um, and then the other one is just um, dedicating the time mm -hmm. and the resources to doing this and doing it well. I mean, everything that Ben described is like the ideal, um, but that's a lot of time that their newsroom has now dedicated to being transparent and to addressing their audience and to explaining their processes. And so, you know, if, if you're not willing to be aggressive and ambitious and dedicate the time, you're just not going to be as successful. So, Ben, I, I want to talk about this because you've had to get, you've had to reconfigure the newsroom. You've had to create new staff positions. But before we get to that, in order to essentially satisfy the expectations of members and so forth. Before we get to that, let's just talk a little bit about, Mary, like what does it mean? How have you designed this so far? And I'm sure this is an evolving process, mm -hmm. but can you talk about how you think about the audience in terms of a sales funnel yeah. now that you've got a membership model? So and, we- And I've got your, your customer flow slide up yes, there. Yes, I mean, there are so many different <coughs> metrics that our newsrooms are inundated with. Um, from page views to, you know, uniques. And so what we really try to be very consistent and specific about are the KPIs that we're trying, the key performance indicators that we're trying to achieve here. So it's, we want to see audience growth. We want to see email subscriber growth always. We want to see conversion from email to membership. And then we want to see retention. So those are the four KPIs that really move the needle. And so all of our conversations that we have each month with our clients are about how are we doing and there are those four KPIs and how are we moving the needle. And so the tools that we provide them um, are modal windows, pop-up windows that come up on their site that are elegant. Um, Civil Beat has a great example of one that sort of pushes up from the bottom of the screen that says, you know, don't miss out, get your daily dose or whatever of, of whatever product that they're, you know, promoting. But getting folks in that email uh, funnel is super important and so a lot of the tools that we provide are along those lines. Um, the other is then just the automated messaging um, through MailChimp. Um, that's what we use right now with some custom connectors um, to make sure that those conversations are happening all the time. The, one, the best thing that, that we've seen and the reason that we've seen so much success is when we take it off the editor's plate and we automate it and they don't have to think about it anymore, then those communications go out. They're really ambitious. They're happening in the background. It's on autopilot and nobody has to be bothered about it anymore. And that's, that's when you're really you know, running on all cylinders is when you can automate a lot of that. And then having a really strong database, we use Salesforce. Um, and we've customized it for news um, so that you can really segment your audiences and keep track of who's given. I mean, you don't want to be messaging someone who's giving you 10 or 20 bucks a month and asking them to give. And so having that, that strong back-end tech stack to really manage all of this is really critical. Otherwise, you're doing a series of one-off asks and, um, and then you don't do it consistently. Okay, but you can't, so, you know, if I need, if I'm going to access more than a certain number of articles at the New York Times or the Washington Post, I have to pay. It's pretty right. clear, right? Uh, if you don't have a paywall and I am stumbling across your content uh, and all of a sudden you're asking me for money, it's a little, it's a little weird. Yeah. Um, how does this work? How do you cultivate that audience? Because you can't walk up to somebody on the street and right. ask them for money. Yeah, we've, we've been pretty um, convinced that it's too big of a leap to go straight from just a story page to a straight donation. So we really do try to get them in the funnel and develop the relationship via email. This year, we're launching um, an experimentation with some metered messaging like what you described. And so it's kind of a flip on the typical uh, paywall message that you might get. So for instance, 
uh, Civil Beat is, is participating in this experiment, and they may decide that after the fifth article that someone reads, uh, the message would come up, hey, Ben, you're clearly a really engaged reader. Instead of walling off our content and telling you that you have to pay, we just want you to pay what you think we're worth. And seeing if we can start to convert people directly from a story page using that very intentional and obvious spin on the metered messaging that they're used to seeing at the times of the post. And how do you price this? How do you understand what this should cost and what people are willing to give? I mean, we're really trying to push for monthly reoccurrings, and uh -huh. $10 a month seems to be the sweet spot. Our average across 16 clients is, is $12 a month. So, um, you know, we had some clients that really just wanted to dip a toe in and ask for five, and we were like, I think you're undervaluing yourself. Push yourself. And some will ask for 10, 15, 20, and get it. So we've really found that if you anchor an amount that you want, people will give what you ask them to give. Um, but that's, you know, that's also data that we're kind of collecting over time. But it looks like the $12 a month thing is the sweet spot for us right now. So, Ben, once you went to this model, right, mm -hmm. you realized that you had deficiencies in your newsroom that weren't, you weren't able to support the kind of product that Mary's talking about. Um, and that you had to create some new positions in order to do that. Can you talk about sort of what, uh, what changed and what shift, shifted in the newsroom uh, in order to kind of better follow through sure. on some of this stuff? So we're, you know, when Mary pitched the email strategy to us, we're all on board. Um, I think one thing to recognize is, you know, because we don't have an ad-based revenue strategy, um, reach, while it's certainly important, at the very top of the funnel, um, it's not the end all be all. So uh, our, our revenue strategy focuses on transitioning these casual readers into core readers. And the best way to do that is via email. Um, I mean, US stats show that you know, 70%, 74% of teenagers use email, 90% 90, 90 of US adults use email. Um, there are 25% more emails sent in 2016 than 2015. Um, people are more receptive toward uh, purchasing items that are advertised through email. Um, so it's the perfect uh, strategy for us to turn you know, the casual uh, Facebook reader into a core reader by sub having them subscribe to our email um, and getting a, a, a daily dose of content um, where they not only click on uh, just duck in and duck out on one particular article, but they understand um, the, the totality of our coverage. Um, so. In understanding that, we went all in on our email. So we hired an email, um, an email newsletter editor. Um, she's she has a, a younger voice, um, and we revamped the look and feel of our newsletter. So it's not just direct links to our content. Um, we try to play around with different things, but basically we considered our newsletters as one of our core products. Um, so uh, a standalone piece where if someone never clicks through to our articles that perhaps they have enough information to start their day. Um, so getting folks in the funnel was really important and we, we made sure we invested in that. Um, when we made the transition, we had about 4,000 uh, email subscribers. Um, two months after that, we revamped our newsletter um, and about a year later, we currently have about 20 to 22,000 um, email subscribers. Um, it's an audience strategy as well. Um, uh, prior, our email audience made up about 4% of our overall traffic. Uh, now it's up to about 15%. Um, and the average email, the, the average reader comes in through our emails. Uh, they, they stay longer on our site, they click through more articles. Um, so it's exactly the type of behavior that we're trying to cultivate um, among our readers. Do you know what kind of open rate you get on your emails? So our open rate now, it, so it stayed steady. So from mm -hmm. uh, a, a list size of 4,000 to 20,000, we've maintained about a 29% open rate um, and a 9% click rate. Oh, wow. Okay. And so you're really saying that, like, email, which, you know, 1990s, uh, is the key to conversion. People are not coming in via Twitter and suddenly opening up their checkbooks to you. No, because, I mean, with email, we can, with our, our drip campaign, we can, we can, um, uh, so when, just, when you say drip campaign, you want to just quickly summarize what that sure. means? Sure. So in addition to the daily email that our readers get that, have, that, that describes our stories, um, we have what we call a welcome drip campaign that's automated. Um, for us, it's a series of 10 emails. Um, once they sign up, they immediately get the first email, which is sort of a welcome to Civil Beat. Um, it's an auto-generated letter from our editor that talks about this is who we are, this is what we stand for. 
thank you so much for reading. There's no pitch to donate because at this point we need to educate them on who we are and what we do. Um, the second email comes from, I believe it comes from me, um, and I talk about what our uh, principles are in terms of accepting funding from donors, uh, what that firewall looks like, um, and the rules for accepting donations. The third email is from our events manager talking about our events and how it's a huge part of our engagement strategy. Um, and then we have a few other emails that talk about various aspects of our coverage. Once you get to email six, and this is after maybe a month and a half that a person has uh, learned about our content and consumed our content, that's when sort of we, we ramp up the asks. So we say something like, you know, you've been reading us for a month. Um, you're obviously a very engaged reader. Uh, if you value us, please consider making a donation. Um, and the emails following that, that campaign are consistently stronger to the point where um, we're comfortable that this particular reader understands who we are, what we do, and they're in the best position to make an informed decision on whether or not they want to support us. Okay. So we're, I do want to open this up for questions in a moment um, with the time that we have remaining. But first, I just want to ask Mary, you've looked at this market. You're still kind of tweaking this model and trying to perfect it. Do you have any ideas about the growth that's possible? Are we going to hit a ceiling here with memberships, um, do you think? Or is there much more room to run? I mean, I still think there's a ton of room, and I think every news organization should be having this type of conversation with their audience because it's the right thing to do, not just for revenue, but for trust building. And so, you know, at some point, what I would like to see is critical mass of the audience understanding the model, you know, so that we don't have to spend so much time educating and that we can go more quickly to conversion. Um, but I, so I think we do need everybody kind of doing this so that we have this understanding that you don't just open up your computer or your phone and start reading content that has magically been produced for free, right? We need to continuously confront the audience with the realities of, of the business model. Okay. Um, so with that and the time that we have remaining, I'd just like to ask folks in the audience if they have questions here. I don't know if we need a microphone. Uh, let me just, oh, here we go. We do have one right here. So let me just, uh, this gentleman in the front row, and then I'll hit you there. So uh, um, jobs at a nonprofit are at, at premium. How many positions do you really need to add to support this kind of effort? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I can let Ben speak to the editorial side because I do think you should be investing or at least restructuring the editorial team to be able to deliver on the newsletter side. Um, on the development team side, if you're working with uh, the News Revenue Hub, not to plug my service, but it's, you know, it helps to be able to outsource a lot of that. So having like one development person or one and a half development people focusing on doing the on the ground strategy of, of cultivating the, the members is, is like a bare minimum. Okay. Uh, let's see, over second row there, we had a question. Uh, when you talk about uh, readers, uh, how do you distinguish them from uh, advertisers or PR firms or whatever? Do you need, because a lot of people do want to, to um, make efforts to, to uh, steer the journalists. And uh, how do you, do you make that distinction, or, s or can everybody be a reader? Yeah, I mean, I think it's whoever his values and appreciates the content. And um, at Voice of San Diego, we, we really found that there was a niche of our audience who really needed the content we produced in order to do their job better. You know, they worked for the city, or they were a teacher, or they were a PR firm. Um, but it's not like they get special access to get a message out in, in return for supporting us. Yeah, I think in, with the membership model, you're not, um you're not sacrificing your editorial decision making and, and handing it to your readers. Um, I think I want to stress that you're you're being more transparent as to how to go about uh, making decisions so that your your reader becomes more educated um, in how we how we go about our work. Okay, thank you. Over here we have Natalia, and then we'll try to get back in the room. Hello. Um, I have a question about the difference of your approach um, between the audiences that are geographically concentrated mm -hmm. and those clients who have audiences that are very spread out, mm -hmm. with whom you can't have events that Ben mentioned were a huge part of their strategy or coffees and, and right. so on. Yeah, that was, a big, um, that was a big concern of ours when we first started, and that's why we intentionally created the, the pilot with the first five to have national, regional, and local sites, and, and, and one that even had some global reach. 
And what we found was the value proposition was unique to each organization. Um, and again, the, the benefits are really less about recruiting and more about retention. And so it, the ask is what's really important in providing a product that people care about regardless of where they're located. But then the challenge is how do you really develop and cultivate that relationship with them when you can't do it in person? Um, so we've had organizations do you know, Facebook Live kind of events or webinars where they'll do virtual um, interviews. Um, or it's really through those exclusive member newsletter products that really help build the relationship between the reader and that's, you know, that's good because it doesn't require any kind of geographic distinction. Um, so there's a gentleman who's been waiting patiently up there uh, standing. Uh, fascinating discussion. Just uh, picking up on one point you just made there, Mary, actually about confronting your readers. So. Journalists, we spend a lot of time with, with PRs writing their stories, but we're very bad at PR in ourselves. Yes. And, and say, so how can we PR ourselves better? Um, I don't know if you've, any of the, uh, the panel have got any thoughts on that. How can uh, How can we explain what we, what we do better? That it costs money. It's, yeah. it, it's obvious to us in here, but that it costs money to, to fund journalism and to investigative journalism. Yeah, it's a great question, and that, that, that was a real realization that happened at Voice of San Diego when we, when we launched the membership program. The, the reporters were sort of reluctant to understand their role, and one of the real tangible recommendations that I made to them that they really ran with was they're used to getting emails or shout-outs on social about a story that they, they wrote that was really great, and I just programmed all the reporters to respond by saying, great, the best way to show your support for an article we write is to become a member, right? And so... It was just an easy, tangible thing. I, I, and I think what you're asking is how do they promote themselves, too? But do they feel uncomfortable about that? They didn't. If you're, if you're moving from being a journalist to kind of say, and I would agree with this, we need to do it. Sorry, I need to speak in the microphone again. Um, you know, if, if you're hawking kind of your business and saying you need to pay for this, yeah. do, I do think they it's feel just uncomfortable with that? Sure, there was discomfort, but there's the reality of life. and. It's very, it's very <laughs> uncomfortable not to have a job as well, and so That's I would right. remind them of that. I think too, it's it's it, it also puts the, the pressure on the business side too to understand uh, the editorial mission and and being able to articulate that. Um, you know, we part of our year-end campaign was we featured reporters um, in their own words talking about why they why they do this and why their their beats are so important and. You know, we, we help them with a lot of the fundraising messaging, but um, basically, you know, once they once they write these pitches, it's it's pretty much the business side sort of takes it from there. You know, um, we have you know we've had situations where donors would walk up to specific reporters and just hand them checks and, and donations, <laughs> and that's something that um, it puts them in an awkward position. But we've coached them to say, you know, I, I can't accept your donation because of this, this, and this. Um, so you educate the reader and let them know that there is a firewall and that is something to be respected. But to, to, if you wanted to make a donation, you can go online, you can contact membership at silverbeat.org, um, things of that sort. People actually walk up and offer checks to the journalists, like, yeah. like a bar mitzvah or something. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we've got time for, for two more questions here, I think. Right here, Raju. Hi, uh, Raju, Gizmodo Media Group. Uh, Mary, just a few quick questions about the future state. Um, Blockchain as a payment method to um, if newsletters are driving uh, donors and members, mm -hmm. do you see the ability to accept individuals into the hub rather than just companies? Mm. And then three, if that's the case, uh, is anybody talking about rev share with individuals whose newsletters are driving more subscriptions inside a newsroom? Mm -hmm. And then just one final quick question. Uh, how many people are doing ad-free experiences as a, as a membership model? Yeah, I would say, just to start with the last one, how many are doing ad-free? I would say, you know, there's probably a solid 50% of our, our clients who don't do any advertising at all, and they use that as part of their pitch. Yeah. Like, we're providing you this ad-free experience, and that really helps the reader understand the need for the membership. Except that that's the model, right? saying if you pay, you get... Right. Right. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, exactly. Um, 
Go ahead. He had multiple questions. Yeah, he did. Sorry, sorry, um, question. And the quick answer to, to the blockchain thing, we're exploring it. Um, I think an individual um, newsletter subscriber person could definitely build their own membership base. Um, so we would be open to helping them do that. I think the strategy applies. Um, and it would be more simpler because you wouldn't have the whole website issue. Um, so yes. And the last one was the rev share. Um, definitely, I think some of our clients are going to need to open up to that because several of our clients are what we call content producers where they distribute a lot of their content through other media outlets and so they don't have this direct audience and you really need that to build a membership program. So they need somebody like a newsletter um, producer who has this solid audience and I definitely think like a rev share model would be really interesting. Uh, so we've got one more time for one more question. There was a gentleman here in the front row here, sorry. Uh, okay. Hi, Philips. Uh, question to Ben. If you would have some kind of magical option to go back in time and work again with this payable model, do you see what would you have to do different to make it work? If we were to stick with the subscription-based yes. model? Yes, so payable, I, yeah. So I, I came on board after they made the decision. Um, I, w I would think... So there are four pro I mean, so the New York Times, you know, they're subscription based and they're using a lot of the strategies that, you know, we've learned from the News Revenue Hub. Um, I, I just received a pitch from one of their reporters that talked about why, why they do what they do. And instead of a donate at the bottom, it was a subscribe. So I think there are ways to um, put your, your mission first and out front while having a, a for-profit business model. It's, it's a matter of, um, making sure that there's enough room in your messaging to sort of make that a priority. And I think, you know, the Washington Post is starting to, to experiment with that as well. And um, The Guardian has been doing it for quite a while too. So I think um, that's something that we would have experimented with um, had we stuck with the subscription model. So I think we're just about out of time here. I want to thank all of you for coming and some of you who had to stand the whole time. Thank you so much. And thank you to our panelists, Mary and Ben. Thank you. Thank you.